Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. Today is uh, another poll list review. So I'm going to be talking about some comic books that I read during the month of January 2021. Yay, new year and new comics, Uh, at least for me anyway. Well, some old comics too, actually, or maybe just the one. Well, technically... Technically more than one, but one I've read before, but I reread. Um, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, first, um, uh, I, got, I read a bunch of things in January, uh, in in some part due to uh, uh, while I was um, exercising uh, on my bike, riding my bike, spinning, spinning my wheels, as it were. And I've talked about this before in uh, previous episodes uh, where uh, I'm supposed to be exercising every day of the week. Well, Every weekday. Anyway, I'm not always successful at it, but uh, for the days that I'm actually on my bike, I read a a trade collection or a graphic novel or whatever is handy. And I certainly have a lot of those books on my shelf. So um, much of these, many of these are um, are uh, collections uh, of things that I've been that I had ordered and wanted to read. And so I'll be talking about a bunch of those. But but up first are some digital books, digital comics that I read uh, on the DC Universe Infinite app. And uh, uh, can I just go on record and and say I really hate saying DC Universe Infinite? (laughs) I, you know, it's a marketing thing. I get it. But good Lord, Um, it's a mouthful. So uh, anyway, on the DCU app, which is what how I will continue to refer to it, uh, I read a few things. I read uh, Superman, Man of Steel, issues 80, 81, and 82. And the reason I did so was because of a series of panels that uh, have been going around as a sort of meme during the last year or two, I think. Uh, I know I've encountered this before 2020, and, uh, and I think at some point in 2020 I saw it again, and I took these uh, this, this, this series of panels and I posted it uh, to my personal Facebook page as a, uh, I, don't, I forget what they call it, but I, I added it as a kind of like a banner thing. Not really banner. I don't remember what they call it now. Uh, featured picture, featured photo, I think. You may be aware of this. This is the one where it shows Superman, like, a, like the golden age Superman, talking to a crowd of people. And uh, he's saying he's saying the following. Listen up, folks. Call me what you want, but I will never be a champion of Nazism. I will not be anyone's symbol of hate, racial prejudice, and genocide. I'm an American. Like all true Americans, I must strive to be a champion of tolerance and diversity, justice, and kindness. That's what being an American, a human being, means. Shame on you if you think otherwise. Wonderful words. Written by... According to the uh, credits here on the DCU app, John Bogdanov and Louise Simonson with pencils by John Bogdanov, inks by Dennis uh, Janke uh, with the cover by Bogdanov and Janke. Like I said, I, I, have, I saw that, that uh, going around online and I added it to my, my Facebook page. Um, and then I, was, I came across it again. Uh, I, in fact, I think I heard uh, someone on a podcast mention uh, this this book, this particular issue. And I realized I had never gone and read it. And so, of of course, once I realized what issue it was, Superman, Man of Steel, number 80, I went to the app and uh, read it and then read the next two issues, like I said, 80 through 82. And so uh, this was a a, a great um, uh, Golden Age Superman-esque, because it's not not truly the golden age Superman. It's, it's our, at the time of publication, uh, the modern day Superman having some sort of weird, uh, timey wimey hijinks tale, uh, that where he and Lois Lane are experiencing life as if they were living in the late thirties, uh, during, you know, pre-World War II. And, uh, and, and this Superman, this, uh, golden age Superman, "Quote unquote Golden Age Superman uh, has has some adventures uh, in America, of course, and in that scene that I just read, uh, where he's he, he is being co opted by these uh, 
uh, neo-Nazis. Uh, well, would they be neo-Nazis? That would come later, right? Anyway, Nazis in America or Nazi sympathizers, maybe that's a, the more appropriate phrase. So he uh, deals with them as, as, uh, uh, as, I, as I described earlier and, uh, and then goes on an adventure in Germany and uh, doesn't quite, I don't think he quite punches Hitler like Captain America did, but um, he does deal with a lot of things that I don't, I honestly don't know if the Golden Age Superman ever dealt with those things in like in a in a real continuity type way, I don't think so. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely showing my ignorance of uh, Superman and DC Comics publication history right now. Regardless, I really enjoyed these three issues. Uh, it was really cool to see uh, Superman drawn in that, uh, uh, golden age style. Um, if I were a true Superman fan, I would be able to tell you what, uh, Bognov and Janky are, are evoking with their, uh, depiction of Superman in, in these stories. But I'm sure they're, they're trying to, to evoke, uh, Joe Schuster's work, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't say that for certain. Uh, cause it, it looks to me, it looks to me to be more like a blend of Schuster and maybe some other, other artists, but I, I really don't know. Uh, it's something I should remedy, I guess. But, uh, if, if you want to read a, a Superman out of time tale, that, that doesn't take much much time to, to read through. Uh, I recommend this. Um, I particularly liked the rendition of the costume. Uh, this is, you know, I've seen this before in like early golden age, uh, Superman images where it looks more like a circus strongman suit, especially in the leggings. Uh, but, but they did a, a neat, a neat thing with the, with the S shield, which is, which is more triangular. I, in fact, I think it is a triangle, but the way that they drew the stylized S is really cool. And I don't think I've ever seen before. So that's my digital comics reading. Uh, beyond that, uh, I read a couple, like I said, a couple uh, older issues, um, but uh, one of which was actually new to me, and that is a couple of issues of Brave and the Bold, uh, issues one seventy seven and one seventy nine. And so uh, many years ago, I decided that I wanted to get a bunch of these team up books. So Brave and the Bold, Marvel Two in One, Marvel Team Up. And, and not just, uh, not, not get a, a full run of these because I honestly couldn't, um, not without paying a bunch of money to, uh, uh for some of those issues. But, um, uh, so I, I, uh, I decided to focus on getting the characters that, that the, the, the lead character would team up with. And, uh, those would be, uh, the ones that I'm interested in. And so in this case, uh, or, or maybe even just kind of like oddball team ups. Um, and so I got, uh, like I said, issue 177, which is a team up with the elongated man, uh, which is, you know, one of those stretchy heroes that I particularly like. Um, I prefer him over Mr. Fantastic (laughs) and also plastic man. Um, and I'm sure I'm probably in the minority there, but, uh, anyway, the cover, um, by Jim Aparo, just has uh, the the villain of the story, the hangman, uh, hanging Batman with the stretchy neck of an unconscious, elongated man. So you know that's that's pretty interesting. And um, uh, what's really neat about this story uh, is that it's presented as a mystery to us, the reader. And 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 I think they did this a lot, quite a bit, uh, as I recall. Um, reading Batman comics when I was younger, so they would give us the clues, and then basically, in the, in this case, in this specific case, and I'm I'm pretty sure I saw this in other issues again. Um, they challenged us, the readers. Do you do you know who the 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 the, the villain is? Uh, have you figured it out, dear reader? And of course, I didn't, because I don't I don't play along with those games. I'm not your puppet, DC. Uh, but I, but I did enjoy you know them going through the mystery. The interaction, um, I enjoyed more the interaction between Batman and Elongated Man. And in fact, there's, there's this one scene where, um, the Bruce Wayne and, uh, Ralph Dibney are talking in Batman's, uh, penthouse. This is back when he was not in the Batcave, I think. And Elongated Man says to Bruce, uh, I sure hope this case picks up, though. Maybe one of the victims will leave a nice dying clue or be killed in a locked room. Or, Ralph, how can you talk that way? We're dealing with people's lives. You seem to think this is some sort of game. 
Uh, don't take everything I say at face value, Bruce. I feel the same as Byron. Look it up. It's Don Juan, Cantu 4, stanza 3. Uh, Bruce calls to Alfred, Bring my Byron, would you? If I may, Master Bruce, from my years on the stage, I recall the quotation to which Master Dibney refers. Quote, And if I laugh at any mortal thing, tis that I may not weep. And Bruce is looking looking down uh, down at his city, and he says, Isn't it odd, Alfred? You can be acquainted with someone for years and never really know them. So I thought that was just a nice little bit of introspection here. Uh, you don't really see that kind of um, writing uh, depiction of Batman these days, for the most part anyway. Um, the other thing that I, I found when I, as I've been reading these Brave and the Bolds, um, <laughs> the villains sure easily dispatch Batman so that they can trap him and try to kill him. Of course, he has to get out of it. So that happen, happens a lot in here. Uh, I don't know that you would... Again, you don't really see that these days. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to, to take a look back at the past and, and see how these things are. And, and what a, what a dumb looking costume for the hangman. He's, he's wearing this black bodysuit. Uh, he's wearing, of course, a rope around his neck, a hang, hangman's noose. Um, but what's dumb about it really is the stylized H the green H over his black bodysuit that stretches from basically uh, his shoulders down his legs with uh, with the cross part of the H being around his belt area, which I, I you know, I maybe I'm being too critical. I'm sure it's a fine enough design. I guess, like I said, I shouldn't be too critical because, you know, the greatest superhero of all has a big S emblazoned on his chest. So <laughs> I still think it's hokey. The other one is uh, issue 179, and this is something that I bought off the shelf, uh, the spinner rack, as it were, um, back in the day. And this is a team up with, between Batman and the Legion of Superheroes. And um, I mean, this is not something you would normally see Batman or this the, 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 the Legion is not a group uh, of whom Batman would typically team up with because of the time travel aspect. And so we had to have this little convoluted plot involving this character. Uh, I think his name was Anton something or another, but he's got this weird, he's got the, like, I, like uh, the blades of a, of a, of an ax, uh, on the sides of his head. It's just, it's a weird design. But then again, if you take a look at the uh, cosmic boys, old bustier outfit, um, maybe not so weird, but anyway, um, this involves Batman uh, being transferred against his will to the 30th century and then teaming up with the Legion to spoil the plot of not this Anton guy who's featured on the cover, but the uh, the mystery villain who's not such a mystery because of the way he's drawn uh, in here. It turns out to be Universo and um, and basically just a plot to kill the Legion by blowing up like 50 kilometers of Metropolis that's that's it that's the plan uh, it's just you know goofy um uh late is it late bronze age or post bronze age, bronze age fun all right now we get into the collection part of of my reading for the for the month of january 2021 i have a bunch of these books here uh and the first one i'll talk about briefly because i have other plans to talk about this book this series in another episode, and this is Giant Days Volume 5. And I, I will say, at the risk of repeating myself in a future episode, um, Giant Days is a delight and uh, something I look forward to reading. Um, I bought the first volume of Giant Days uh, when it was first released, and then it sat on my shelf for a while. And I didn't read it, I didn't read it, and then I finally did, and I fell in love. And so then I've been trying to read the other, uh, well, first of all, I had to go, I had to go find them. I went on a binge, uh, last year and decided to buy all of the collections that I, that I could get my hands on, which thankfully was all of them, uh, from a few different vendors, however. Um, but now I have them all <laughs> and I can't wait to read them because, uh, this, this book is just such a delight. Um, this, this is, uh, this, this book features, the end of their first year of school, the characters in the book. Uh, as it says, their freshman year is coming coming to a close, and Daisy, Susan, and Esther say goodbye to 
Catterick Hall forever, literally forever. It's being bulldozed and repurposed as a luxury dorm the following semester. But as one door closes, another opens, and between end-of-semester hookups, music festivals, and moving into their first home together, the life experiences are just getting started. And of course, this is by John Allison, um, uh, Max Saren, and Liz Fleming. Uh, Yeah, so good. Like I said, I, I don't want to say too much about this because I plan on talking a lot more about it in a uh, in a future soon to soon to come episode of the Long Box Review podcast. But I highly recommend this book. Uh, one of the next books I read with a, a lovely Tula Lotte cover is the is Volume One of Safe Sex or SFSX uh, here called Volume One Protection. This is from Image Comics, uh, and I should have said Giant Days is from Boom. Um, but anyway, um, uh, the back of the book blurb here from notorious kink writer Tina Horn, uh, and featuring a diverse group of artists including Jen Hickman, Michael Dowling, Alejandra Gutierrez, and Tula Lotte doing covers, comes this book, Safe Sex, a social thriller about sex, love, and torture. In a draconian America where sexuality is strictly bureaucratized and policed, a group of queer sex workers keep the magic alive in an underground club called the Dirty Mind. Using their unique talents for bondage and seduction, they resolve to infiltrate the mysterious government pleasure center, free their incarcerated friends, and fight the power. What that blurb does not tell you is the uh, deeply personal pain that these characters go through in, in various ways. Um, not only, as I, as I said on the book here, uh, the dr- draconian government controlling their 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 sexual lives, other other people are tortured, and and uh, try, they're trying to convert them, um, and other people appear to be brainwashed, um, and and betray those that they worked with in in this in the in the the dirty mind sex club. This is uh, this is a you, you might have guessed a not safe for work so to speak book not safe for the kitties. Um, there are explicit images in this, uh, but it's not it's not at all um, gratuitous. You know it, it treats its its subject matter in a mature fashion. What was interesting about this book was uh, there are three main artists on here. Uh, they and I, I read them earlier. Jen Hickman who did, I think, three of the seven issues that are collected here. Uh, Michael Dowling, who also did three, I think. And then Alejandro uh, Gutierrez did one, which was, which was a flashback tale. Um, and so the art, the art styles between uh, Dowling and Hickman are, are somewhat similar, though I will say I prefer uh, Dowling. Um, uh, and Gutierrez is, is, is very different. It's a, it's a, you can tell it's a different tone, very different style. Uh, so it was interesting to see a, a series like this. Uh, and this, this is something that could go on. I don't know. I'm not aware that it has continued past, uh, issue seven, but it, um, it certainly could, like I said, but, but still it, it uh, it, it's interesting that that they that they chose to use different artists like this. I can understand using a different artist for like the flashback thing, but why? What hap- Why did Dowling not finish the series? Why? Why was Jen Hickman brought in? Um, was that intentional? Because, like I said, the the, the styles are somewhat similar. So I, I can only imagine that uh, Dowling had to bow out of the project. I don't know. I'm totally. I have no idea. I'm totally speculating here. Uh, the only other thing I'll say about this, and I won't say too much because it kind of it may spoil something, um, is that the this the, the uh, this ragtag group of of folks uh, go off to save one of their own, and there is a twist to it that I appreciated, and I can't say that it is a in a, a very satisfying twist in one regard, but it is in another. So um, I will leave you with that. And then uh, to continue the um, uh, the sexy part of, of this podcast, <laughs> can't even say that without laughing, is uh, volume one of Money Shot. So 
This is by Tim Seeley and Sarah Beatty writing it, uh, Rebecca Isaacs uh, drawing, and Kurt Michael Russell coloring with letters by Crank. And this is from Vault Comics. Uh, This is a good um, summation of the series. In 2027, an advanced alien civilization made contact, and the people of Earth discovered that they were not alone. An offer to join the civilized universe was made, but then the aliens saw what a total shit show Earth was. (laughs) Unfortunately, it's true. Uh, Engaged in hundreds of wars led by greedy politicians and fumbling to advance technologically, humanity was deemed not worth the effort. The offer was withdrawn. Unable to build spaceships capable of efficient interstellar travel and distracted by petty bickering and pop entertainment, humans eventually lost interest in the stars. Now, in 2032, amid an anti-science presidential administration hmm, and public apathy, hmm, scientists in an economically crippled America struggle to fund innovative projects. And so... Uh, Scientist Christine Ocampo, inventor of the Starshot teleportation device, had a big idea. She'll travel to to new worlds, engage intimately with local aliens, and film her exploits for a jaded Earth populace trying to find something new on the Internet. And so she she gets uh, uh, a group of uh, four other scientists that she knows to to, uh, go along with her and explore the universe, each other, and the complexities of sex. Uh, as it says here, a story about scientists having sex with aliens for the glory of mankind and money. So this <laughs> this book surprised the hell out of me. Um, when when I when I heard about it, I'm like, well, that sounds interesting, uh, but do I want to read it? Um, the the whole aspect of uh, exploring the universe in in this way intrigued me. I have to I have to admit. Um, but what really surprised me was how this is this is not just you know one big joke it's not a it's not a um uh, a sexual plaything it's not just titillation uh, although there's there's a certain aspect of this it is it is it is really about exploring the complexities of sex and relationships uh with the, with with these characters and it's not at all simple it, uh it, it's it's not simply told either um, I care less about the sexual exploits of these characters, uh, and thankfully, the book uh, also approaches it that way as well, because it's it is really about the relationships and uh, getting getting over the hangups of sex and and uh, um, male female 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 male male relationships. Uh, I was it was just it was a surprise. It was a delight and a surprise. One of the characters is Dr. Doug Koch, uh, a biochemist. He's like this really big guy, really big white guy, bald head. And uh, you see him, the first time you see him, um, he seems to be um, uh, uh, pressing a microscope uh, like it's a weight. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you, you are, you're already forming a- an opinion of him based on this one image. And... Once Dr. Ocampa, Ocampo, sorry, I'm thinking uh, Star Trek Voyager is getting into my brain. Um, once she explains this whole idea uh, of, of using uh, this teleportation technology, the other, the, one of the other scientists whose name is uh, Bree Wander, she's a physicist, um, she came up with a, basically a universal translator if I remember, remember the story correctly. And then of course the other scientists talents and skills and knowledge come into play, uh, uh, during the rest of uh, the series. And anyway, uh, like I said, back to, back to Dr. Coke, um, after Ocampo explains all this, you know, and, and oh, wait, did, did I make it clear? Ocampo wants to do this because she wants more money to fund her research and to develop more technology. And so, it, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the sex part is just a means to an end anyway. So she explains all this stuff um, so, so that we can get back to doing what we're supposed to be doing, competing for glory, making the world a better place, sciencing. And uh, they all just kind of look at her for, for a beat. 
And then uh, Dr. Koch puts the microscope that he's been pressing uh, on the table and says simply, supermassive black hole. What? Uh, Dr. Combo says, my porn name. I'm in, but only if everyone calls me supermassive black hole. And, and so uh, immediately Dr. Koch surprises me um, because he's going uh, against expectations based on what we've already seen. And I think it's just a, it's a wonderful examination of of self and other and how we see each other and what uh, what our prejudices bring to our perceptions of others and how you know people aren't that they're not just that for sure and uh, it, uh, just uh, you know Tim Seeley and um uh Sarah Beatty and Rebecca Isaacs are just are just doing a fantastic and unexpectedly lovely job at, at, uh, telling the story. And, uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to, um, reading volume two, which I have already ordered. In fact, uh, it came down to the point where I was looking through previews and saw that volume two was solicited and I hadn't read volume one yet. And so I, you know, as I often do when I am in that situation, I immediately pick up that book and start reading it. And I was so pleasantly surprised and I'm so glad that I, that I have read it. Uh, there, there's a, there's a couple scenes in here where, uh, Dr. Ocampo says, basically we have to be intimate with each other and it's not for any, you know, just, just to get her rocks off. Um, it is, it is to break down those barriers because they're going to go off into space and, and engage in intimate relations with alien cultures and be filming this for, for, you know, people back home. And so they need to be, they need to be intimate with each other, familiar with each other and comfortable with each other. And, and so what would normally be something presented uh, as a joke was presented in a very touching way between uh, Dr. Ocampo and the aforementioned uh, Dr. Wander. Uh, Dr. Wander uh, does not care for Dr. Ocampo, at least that's how it's presented at first. And, um, uh, <laughs> they're, you know, they, they have sex with each other and then after, and apparently it was very good. Um, and then afterwards, Dr. Ocampo requests that, uh, they cuddle and, and, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Wander does not want to do that, but then she does. So it was just very sweet. And then there's another scene, uh, between Dr. Koch and then the other male doctor here, Dr. Omar Steinberg, an astrophysicist, they have sex with each other. And, uh, they have this, uh, again, I'm using this word a lot for this book, but this very intimate conversation about their past and how they grew up and, and, you know, growing up male in these, uh, different situations, but, but there are some similarities between them and, and, and whatnot. So I just, I just really thought this was a, a, a very well done book. And it's not just about the the naked the naked people in it uh, that makes it interesting. Uh, in fact, that is probably the less interesting, not the not the least interesting part, because that's actually the the bit the the plot about the alien conqueror queen that it makes up much uh, much of the story in in this first volume. Anyway, highly recommend this one. Two books, two collections of the same series. Well, technically not, but but basically they are. Uh, this is Dark Ark, Volume Three, and then Dark Ark After the Flood. And this is from these are both from Aftershock, of course. This is by Colin Bunn and Juan Do and Jesus Hervas on the uh, After the Flood one. So uh, this is a book that I have been reading uh, for a little while now. Basically, the premise is, in case I haven't talked about this before, two arcs were built to, sur to survive the flood, the biblical flood. One was filled with the creatures of the natural world. The other was populated by everything else. And so um, the Noah's counterpart is this sorcerer who made a deal with, a, uh, I'll just say, a demon. Uh, and so he built an ark and then brought like the vampires and the chimeras and... You know, just all the fantastical creatures, not all of whom are wonderful, of course. Uh, you know, they're, they're the stuff of nightmares. 
and uh, they set off too, and they're they're off to find uh, land after the flood, and also then to create the world in the vein of the demon's view of it, and you know, make a darker world. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how that is supposed to work out because we don't really get to that uh, or get that explanation. But it's been an interesting story so far with many of the. Uh, the creatures uh, of the story bickering among themselves, conspiring against each other, feeding off of each other, uh, conspiring against the the sorcerer, and uh, you know it's a lot of a lot of uh, politics going on on this ship. Uh, all at the same time, all during the same time, you know they're just trying to survive and get to find land and build an, their own civilization. And in volume three. Uh, they essentially make it to land and then find that it is occupied by a a force that is in some ways more powerful than them. So that's how volume three ends, which uh, lots of fun. Um, I especially love the Wando art. And really what I like about it is the colors of, of this. The line work is really kind of simple, um, but it's really the colors and the shading that they use to really make this book stand out. There's a lot of scenes which are imbued with a lot of reds and yellows. And that's, you know, those are a lot of the day scenes really. And then the night scenes are a lot of uh, purples and blacks and and muted reds, which I just, I don't know. I just really dig the way that they are coloring this book. And then despite myself, I find that I'm liking some of these, you know, quote unquote monsters, um, including the, Uh, The manticore called Cruel, K-R-U-U-L, who has allied himself with the sorcerer and the sorcerer's family. Um, And then he also, during the course of Volume 3, ends up with a a, a son, and he has to deal with that, (laughs) which is just, it's funny. And then uh, after the flood is, is them dealing with them being, finding land, and then also it ends the story ends with a certain other arc is on its way and so i hope i hope we get more of this because uh after the flood was actually a separate mini series um apart from the dark arc ongoing series of which there were 3 volumes and so when i when i when i saw the solicitation for after the flood i thought oh they're wrapping this up in this mini series, which is unfortunate because like I said, it's, it's been a, a wonderful, uh, read so far, but they left it open, uh, for more. So I'm very curious if we will get a volume. Well, I guess, I guess this is volume four, a volume five, uh, of, of this book. Okay. So, uh, from monsters and the supernatural to more superhero fare. First up is Batman Three Jokers from DC Black Label uh, by Jeff Johns, Jason Fabok, and Brad Anderson. And this is this is the Three Jokers, the story that we've been waiting on for I don't know how many years now. Um, finally saw print, wonderfully illustrated by Fabok and Anderson. Uh, that's probably the the most positive thing about this book, I have to say. Uh, in case you um, were living under a rock and don't know, uh, in Oh, I forget now. It's been so long. Batman sits in the Mobius chair and discovers that the Joker is not one person, but three people. And so there's this big mystery that was set up years ago, and uh, this is the resolution to that. And so there are, uh, like I said, three Jokers, and one is the, what did they say, the criminal, the clown, and the comedian. So the the criminal, the comedian, and the clown. That's how they present it in that order in the book. And along the way, so we have Batman, Batgirl, and Jason Todd, Red Hood. All, uh, of course, the the latter two um, dealing with the trauma that Joker has has, uh, inflicted upon them. And at the same time, there's this, the Joker eventually, hmm, do I want to say <laughs> something happens to the jokers? I'll just say that. And, uh, it's to, 
It's to prove a point, again, to Batman. Joker is always trying to prove a point to Batman. It's something that a lot of writers touch on all the time. So that's why I say, you know, the, the, the art on this was probably the more satisfying aspect of this book, because this feels like just retread material. Um, I've read stories where Barbara has dealt with the trauma of the Joker shooting her. Um, I've, I've, I've read material featuring Jason dealing with the fact that the Joker killed him. Um, and I've also seen a couple movies now, uh, animated movies about that very subject. And, and, and of course the greater, the greater impact of that, which of course is touched on by, by Jason Todd is, you know, the Joker has done all these evil things, not just to the citizens of Gotham, but to close people in Bruce's circle. And yet Bruce allows him to live. So, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? Does your moral code, does it really trump, uh, ridding the world of, of such evil? And I guess that's really just the argument for capital punishment, right? Um, and it's not an easy one. Um, I actually struggle with that, that argument with myself, but the, the problem is, is they don't really, Johns and company does not really delve into it. It's just mentioned and glossed over in favor of the, uh, the, the, the character drama that the, the, the Joker, uh, flares up within these, the, the, the two younger characters. And then, um, and then there's a couple, there's a couple points of this. I just want to touch on, um, I don't want to reveal too much, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but, uh, there is a, uh, Jason, has a moment with Barbara or they have a moment with each other. Yeah. That's probably the best way to put it. But then of course, Barbara puts the kibosh on that. And then there's a, there's a, there's a touching scene later in the book that is very, um, sitcom esque in its execution. Um, but definitely not in the tone. And I just, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, I am very public and, and uh, about my dislike for the character Jason Todd, especially when he became Red Hood. You know, I didn't I actually didn't mind him so much when he was Robin. Uh, but uh, when he became Red Hood and he's become that that character in the Batman family, I don't care for him. And so to 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 put those two together, even in the briefest of fashions, um, just does not sit well with me. The other thing was uh, there was another reveal, which you know, your mileage may vary is maybe even more important than, oh, there's three, three jokers, uh, is, uh, the revelation that Batman, he's always known who the Joker really was. In fact, he knew shortly after he encountered the Joker the first time, uh, what's important is, uh, what's more important than that is, well, okay, let me, let me go back to that. So, Again, given given what Batman knows Joker has done to his protégés, uh, and he knows who the Joker is, shouldn't that obligate him to to do something about that? Is there is there any means by which knowing that having that knowledge would allow him to address the Joker in a more permanent fashion? And I, and I don't necessarily mean kill him. Uh, I don't want Batman should never kill. In fact, most superheroes should never kill. No superheroes should kill because then they're not superheroes, right? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, what what kind of obligation does Bruce have given given his knowledge? And then, but then there's another thing that happens in the story involving Joker's family, and I'll just leave it at that. That I found quite touching and and demonstrates where Bruce may fail as a father to Barbara and Jason, he makes up for narratively, at least in the, in this particular act that I won't go into detail about. So you guys have to read it and find out, but I, but I did like that. The only other thing I'll say, uh, again, having to do with the the quality of the story is the absence of, of Dick Grayson here. Now I know you know, Dick hasn't suffered, quote unquote, in the same way that Barbara and Jason have. But, you know, he he was there early on with 
Batman and the Joker. And so and I'm sure he's he survived his fair share of Joker traps and um and whatnot. So having that different perspective I felt would have elevated the story a little bit more. Uh and maybe, you know, Dick being Dick Grayson, who who he is, he could have helped the situation, at least help, tried to help Barbara and Jason deal with what they're going through in this particular story. Um, but then that would that wouldn't allow for Barbara and Jason to have that moment <laughs> either. So you know, a very calculated move, I think, on um, on Jeff John's part uh, to only include certain characters here. Anyway, it was okay. What I particularly loved, this is probably my favorite of everything that I'm going to talk about today. I've got this and one more book to talk about, um, is from Dynamite Comics, Peter Cannon Thunderbolt by Kieran Gillen and Casper Wingard. Uh, Mary Safro uh, does colors and Hassan Atzman Elhau uh, letters. This was a delight. However, at first when I read it, I thought it was it relied too much on being a retold Watchmen story. Peter Cannon, of course, is the the inspiration for Ozymandias in Watchmen, uh, and uh, basically, re, uh, Gillen is retelling Watchmen for a good chunk of the first part of the story. Uh, but once you get past that. Uh, there's some really interesting ideas that uh, Gillen and uh, Wingard are are bringing into this, and they refer to it as formalism in here. and And so there there's a particular scene where Peter Cannon, the Thunderbolt, uh, has his his super team companions lay down on this grid, and it's a nine panel grid. And so again, connections to Watchmen, right? But it goes beyond that, and there, there, there's a point in the story in which Cannon uses that formalism to break through to other worlds, and so uh, it, it's just a very clever use of comic book, comic bookness, comic book tropes, comic book structure to. Uh, integrated into the story uh, that I thought was uh, shy of ingenious. <laughs> at least it's it's at the very least it's it's uh, it's very interesting to read. Yeah, it was just it was a lot of fun, and it, and it, and it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't just stop with like the nine panel grid. There's other aspects of comic book storytelling such as. Um, uh, the uh, inner model monologue that's that's touched on as a method of mm, or a use of power I'll say in here and and in the end uh, you we even have a nice growth of character in Peter Cannon because at the very beginning of the book he is presented as very detached and um, doesn't want to save the world doesn't care to save the world why should the world be saved it's a it's a it's a it's a hellhole so why why even bother um and and as as the story goes along and he goes into the quote unquote real world at one point and encounters the his real world counterpart he learns a very valuable lesson in humanity and uh i i just i thought that was really nice the uh the only thing I'll, other thing i'll say about the book besides you should go read it um is that it's an oversized. I got the oversized hardcover, which is about uh, I'll say about an inch wider and uh, almost two inches taller than your typical comic book. And I don't understand why they did this. Um, there's nothing in the art that really lends itself to the larger pages. Um, it's just they're just bigger pages. So, I mean, I guess in in some cases there's more space to put like uh, like text caption boxes and whatnot, but beyond that, there's there's I'm not really seeing a whole lot of innovative uh, page layouts or anything. So, and then similarly, 
for the final book. Uh, this is Adventure Man, Volume 1, by uh, Matt Fraction, uh, the Dodsons, and Clayton Coles. And this is an oversized hardcover collection as well. And this is even bigger than the Thunderbolt collection. Um, they are the same height, but uh, the Adventure Man collection is about another uh, inch, you know, inch plus wider. And and again, <laughs> I don't I don't see what 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 advantage we have here. These are just you know just bigger pages. There's nothing again very innovative about the art or the page layout here. Uh, um, but as, as since I'm talking about the art, um, I mean it's very nice Dodson art. It's it's uh, I've seen this before though. It uh, it uh, it's good art. It's just okay. It's there. <laughs> Um, but the story, uh, you know, the reason I wanted to read this in the first place, um, it says here where his story ended, her story begins the story of adventure man, the greatest pulp hero of all time ended in a heartbreaking cliffhanger with our hero facing his very execution. Now learn the startling truth about what came next decades after his seeming demise, the world has all but forgotten adventure man, save for single mother, Claire and her adventure fan son, Tommy. Together, they'll, they'll light the spark of Adventure Man's resurrection. But if the good guys are coming back, you can bet the bad guys won't be far behind. Um, and so this is uh, uh, this is from Image Comics uh, as well, collecting Adventure Man number one through four. In this deluxe edition, it says, um, uh, very nice to look at um, uh, the story involving the mother Claire not as interested in that. In fact, I gravitated more towards the flashback stuff, uh, telling us uh, about the, the original adventure man, uh, rather than what is going on with Claire, because, and this is something I hate about, uh, some, some comic books that I've read, uh, over the years. And in fact, more recently is that the character, something happens to the characters. And, um, instead of trying to figure out what's going on, why it's happening to them, et cetera. They just kind of go about blissfully, ignorantly about their day. Like, oh yeah, I'm now two feet taller and, and 20 pounds heavier. Um, but I'll just go to work. And I'm, I'm horribly, uh, summarizing something that happens in the book, but it's just like, what, if that happened to me, I'd be a little more concerned about it. And not only would I be concerned about it, my wife would be concerned about it. My family would be concerned about it, but nobody seems to be concerned about what's going on with Claire other than she's behaving weirdly and that's it. So I, I didn't care for that. I'm not sh- quite sure what fraction's going for with that, uh, fraction and Dotson, uh, in this, but, um, it, you know, it, it, it is a, it is, it's a story that's reminiscent of, uh, pulp adventures. Um, and, uh, I like that aspect of it. So, um, you know, if you like, if you like, uh, Terry Dodson's art, uh, you should uh, pick this up. <laughs> uh, I would have been quite happy with a non deluxe edition hardcover, um, of this, cause now I have to store this somewhere else other than with the rest of my collection. Um, but, uh, so I'll need to pay more attention to that. This is the thing, the, the same thing about the, the Thunderbolt, uh, book, I had no idea that these were oversized <laughs> collections. Um, uh, I just, I need to pay more attention when I'm, I'm, when I'm ordering this stuff, but anyway, that's, that's beside the point. So, uh, there you go The That's my uh, January, 2020 books that, uh, I've read. Uh, I'm already well into, uh, my list of February books, even though I technically am recording this in early March, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's those times, man. I, I, I only have so many hours in the day, uh, but I will be back to talk about those February books at some point in the near future. And hopefully also, uh, my year end round year, year in year end wrap up that I usually do. I, you know, I normally put that out in February, but here we are in March as I'm recording this. So hopefully soon I will have that retrospective done as well. Let me know what you think about these particular books that I have talked about. Um, And then let me know also what you're reading. What are you liking? And you can do so. You can let me know these things by emailing me at longboxreview at gmail.com. You can also leave comments at the blog, longboxreview.com. And also on Twitter, you can message me there at 
Longbox Review. And with that, I leave you. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you soon.